Good morning. My name is Michael Sneed, and I'm the Executive Vice President of Global Corporate Affairs and Chief Communication Officer at Johnson & Johnson. We are thrilled and humbled by the opportunity to sponsor this Health Equity Summit, and we are grateful for our many years of partnership with the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. At Johnson & Johnson, we are committed to helping eradicate racial and social injustice as a public health threat by eliminating health inequities for people of color. As part of that commitment, we recently announced an initiative titled Race to Health Equity. With $100 million in funding over five years, we are investing in building healthier communities, forging enduring alliances, and cultivating our own people-first culture. That's why we're so excited for today's conversations on two critical topics, the impact of COVID-19 vaccine on the Black community and mental health realities for Black America. It is conversations like these and resources like blackdoctor.org and covidvaccinefacts.org that result in stronger partnerships and lead to real change. Thank you for being here and enjoy today's dialogue. Hello, thank you for joining our Health Equity Summit, Mental Health Realities for Black America. This important conversation is dedicated to addressing the mental health challenges heightened by COVID-19 and other systemic barriers we face as Black people every day. This panel of mental health experts will share their experiences and observations on the well-being of our community and solutions to overcome these challenges. Our goals from this discussion is to equip you with the knowledge, tools, resources to care for your mental health. Before we begin this conversation, I want to introduce Congresswoman Bonnie Watson Coleman, Chair of the CBC Emergency Force Task Force on Black Youth Suicide and Mental Health. Congresswoman Watson Coleman has been a leader in this space, sponsoring the Pursuing Equity and Mental Health Act, passed by the House in September of 2020. The Congresswoman's bill will authorize $805 million in funding the support for national health efforts. We are lucky to have her leadership in our government. Like We're lucky to have her leadership um, Co uh, Congresswoman Coleman continues to fight to ensure our community has access to the resources to stay strong and healthy as we manage through this pandemic and so many other challenges. Thank you so much, Congresswoman Coleman, for being here. Tanya, thank you for the invitation and thank you for your leadership of the foundation and for the foundation taking on these roundtable discussions that are so vitally important and relevant right now. You know, and thank you to all of our experts who are participating here. Um, what you have to say is so vitally important and informs what we can do as members of Congress. Nearly two years ago, I realized that we were having a problem with black youth suicide and mental health when I kept seeing it um, pop up on my Facebook page. As a result, I talked to Karen Bass, who was the um, chair of the CBC at the time, and I said, I don't know what Congress can do here. I know we've got a responsibility to elevate this issue because I was seeing instances of young people, five years old, nine years old, 12, um, who were thinking that suicide was an alternative to whatever it was that they were going through. Some were succeeding and, and some were, were not. But I knew that we need to figure out was there a role for us. So as a result of convening that task force with some a, a very capable uh, working group under Michael Lindsay's um, uh, leadership, we did a series of hearings, heard from a number of people. A report came out called Sounding the Alarm. And then the legislation that you uh, mentioned was uh, developed, um, created, and passed. Now, what we found was that, that there are tremendous gaps and stigma in, in the Black community as it relates to getting mental health uh, help. What we also found was that there were gaps in access to service 
and providers and things of that nature, particularly trusted voices, um, validators, people with cultural competence that our community uh, in need could relate to. We also recognize that with this pandemic going on, it exacerbated uh, the issues that were happening with our families, the insecurities and the anxieties and problems and depressions they were already having before the pandemic were exacerbated. Um, whether or not they were gonna be able to put food on the table, protect their families, keep shelter over their heads. So it was not only affecting uh, the children, but it's affecting uh, the uh, parents as well. And then you put on top of that, this other pandemic that we've experienced with law enforcement and how it treats disparagingly and disproportionately and violently the black community. It is, no, um, it is not without understanding why we're at such a critical juncture right now. But the black community has to have the resources it needs to be the healthiest that it can be. And so when we have these roundtable discussions, it elevates the discussion and it informs us members of Congress what we need to be doing. Because not only do we need more um, uh, research done in these areas, more support to uh, education, for people who would seek to work in this space, but more community and family um, education and empowerment. And then of, of course, most important is the removal of any stigma associated with having a mental health need. If you got a broken leg, you go to an orthopedist. If you have a broken heart, you need to talk to uh, someone in the uh, mental health field. So I wanna thank you, God bless you. Thank you to Johnson & Johnson for uh, being our uh, sponsor here and to all of the wonderful experts that are gonna share their resources and their knowledge on behalf of our community. God bless and have a great day. Thank you, Congresswoman, so much for your uh, partnership and always supporting the CBCF. We appreciate you. Absolutely. I am so excited to kick off this panel. I tell you, it's been quite a year and we're going into 2021. Um, I'm honored to introduce the moderator for today's session. You may have watched her show, Love Goals, on, on, uh, ch on the ON channel or have read about her renowned clinic, T2S Enterprises. I invite you to give a warm welcome to Dr. Spirit. Dr. Spirit, thank you for being here. Oh, please, it is beyond a pleasure to be here today. And I am so excited not only to be here with you all today, but to have the opportunity to sit and pick the brains and discuss with these uh, amazing panelists that we have with us today as well. Mm -hmm. So should we just jump right in? How about that? How about we start by introducing our panelists? And so if we start with first and foremost, let's start with Mr. Courtney Billington. Courtney is not only the president uh, of, Neuro, of Janssen Neuroscience Pharmaceuticals, but he's been with Johnson & Johnson for over 25 years. And he has held a globally diverse strategic leadership role within the pharmaceutical and medical devices sectors. <laughs> Uh, Courtney has also had a career in the 18th Airborne Corps. So thank you so much for your service, uh, Mr. Billington. We are so excited to have you here today and we have so many questions. And we thank you so much for uh, currently being the executive sponsor of the Johnson & Johnson's Veterans Leadership Council as well. Thank you for being with us today. Dr. Spirit, thank you so much for having me, and I appreciate it, uh, Chairman VZ and Congresswoman Bonnie Watson Coleman, for your introductory comments. Uh, it's an honor to serve with the other panelists uh, here today, and I just thank the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation for their ongoing partnership and engagement with Johnson & Johnson to address issues of health disparities and the impacts uh, that these disparities have on the black community. I, being a member of J&J, &J, as you mentioned, I've been with Johnson & Johnson more than 25 years. We have a credo which outlines our values and responsibilities uh, for everyone in our corporation. And one of those responsibilities is our focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion, and also the responsibility to make the communities in which we live and work 
better than when we were given the opportunity to participate in those communities. So I look forward to be able to share uh, some of those things about how we as Johnson & Johnson can partner with all of you uh, to help address some of the needs uh, that are very, very prevalent within the Black community and specifically in the space of mental health. So glad to have you here. And alongside of you today is Dr. Joy Harden Bradford. And I just absolutely love Dr. Joy. Dr. Joy is a licensed psychologist, speaker, and host of the wildly popular mental health podcast, Therapy for Black Girls. Uh, Dr. Joy is just a tremendous, tremendous voice in the mental health space whose work focuses on making mental health topics more relevant and accessible for Black women. And she specializes in creating spaces for Black women to have fuller and healthier relationships with themselves and others. You guys have probably seen Dr. Joy everywhere from O Magazine to Teen Vogue to Essence, you name it. We love her. Joy, thank you so much for being with us on this panel today. Always a pleasure, Spirit. I'm honored to be here and, you know, just really, really um, humbled to be able to have these very important conversations. Um, you know, as therapists, we have really been in the trenches, like you mentioned, doing this work. And so it is really just important for us to continue to have these conversations of how we can take care of ourselves, but also take care of one another. Absolutely. And we have to talk about that, not just taking care of one another in our physical and our mental health, but looking at that from a holistic approach. So I'm so glad to have uh, Mr. Benjamin Kalexti, I'm sorry, rounding out the panel today, who is the founder of therapyforblackmen.org. And Benjamin is a certified professional coach with a holistic approach to health and wellness. Uh, he has over 15 years in the field, not just as it relates to mental health and wellness, but looking at customer relations and experiences uh, in, within a manager managerial capacity, which actually will bring a lot to this conversation today as well as we talk about access and how to go about making mental health something that we can all partake in at every level. So Benjamin, thank you so much for being a part of the conversation with us today. Well, thank you for having me. I'd like to thank the uh, Concussional Black Caucus Foundation for giving me an invite to be part of this esteemed um, panel. And ultimately, mm -hmm. um, we're here to um, basically discuss what it is in terms of as men to be vulnerable, to be transparent, to have a safe space, to be able to talk and convene with one another. Absolutely. And so, you know, I have this, so, you know, as you see, bang on the system is kind of what I want to talk about today, because I think that this conversation is one that is necessary to be able to really shed light on not just where we have been as it relates to uh, Black people in this country, but as it relates to our access to care, why we may experience difficulties uh, barriers or even resistance to utilizing care and what we need to do, uh, not only collectively as a group here today, but what we need to do as a nation to begin to impact that. So I have curated some questions for you all today and I'm hoping that you will share your perspectives. I'm looking forward to a very robust conversation and uh, with no further ado, let me just jump right in. And I wanna start um, from a historical perspective and then work our way forward. Um, so if you will indulge me uh, for our panelists, I wanna ask you all, the historical understanding of black mental health in this country has really been a sordid one. Um, from the fathers of psychology believing that black people lacked even the intelligence to experience mental health issues, to the father of psychiatry believing that black people uh, suffered from mental health issues that could only be cured by us becoming white, to the 1960s and 70s when Black folks were diagnosed with mental illnesses for participating in social justice activities that were considered to disrupt the social order of white America, racism has really been pervasive within our profession. And I think that it's important for us to acknowledge that as we look at some of the reasons why we have the difficulties in accessing care. Um, given the historically toxic relationship between the black community and the mental health community, what do you all think that we need to do in order to address the resistance of our community as it relates not only to seeking treatment, but also let's be real about the use of prescription medications to treat illnesses such as depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, or any other other diseases that could be helped with medication. 
Who'd like to kick that question off? I know it's a big one. I can start spirit. You know, I think really to, to kind of start digging into this concern as mental health professionals, we have to be honest about the history, right? So we can't pretend as if this is not a part of why people don't sometimes trust us or don't feel like it's comfortable to talk with a therapist. We know that historically mm -hmm. it has not been safe to talk with therapists. When we think about, you know, children being separated from families because they told a therapist something or, you know, other instances where um, there has been real harm caused to families and individuals by mental health professionals. And so I think it, it starts with us being honest about that history. And then as black mental health professionals, I think it is really important for us to be transparent about how the work that we do can actually help people to restore themselves, to take care of their mental health, to really kind of make peace in their relationships. And, you know, the stigma, you know, we know that there is a long stigma again, coming from some of that history, but also from some of our own families, right? You know, so some of our own families are responsible for kind of perpetuating this idea that only quote unquote crazy people go and talk with therapists, right? And so I think the more that we can do to normalize the idea that it is very okay not to be okay, especially given all that is happening in the world right now, the better off we will be. Um, you know, as the Congresswoman so eloquently stated, you know, if we have a broken leg, there is no problem going to a, a, an orthopedist, right? But sometimes it is really hard for us to be honest and say we need to talk to a therapist about the things that are going on. But I think that can only happen when as a field, we are honest about the history that we have and really making some steps and taking some actions so that people do feel more comfortable coming to us with their concerns. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Joy. Uh, for you, Benjamin or Courtney. Yeah, I'll jump yes. in. I think it's a very important for our generation to, to bridge that gap to the younger generation. Um, as a male growing up, I know I've been habituated to not really identify with expressing my feelings, verbalizing them. Um, this is something that's um, very important because what you model in terms of behavior as a man is that any sign of weakness is something that you're going to look as being vulnerable. And we need to kind of move from that to a narrative of you're not weak. Actually, when you do identify that you're, something's transpiring in your life and that you're going through something, you're able to identify that. I, I think it's a sign of strength that when you do ask for help, it's not, it's not weakness. Ultimately, you get to a point in your life where you want to change something and you've kind of are, are hitting the wall. But you need to be able to see how you could change that paradigm, shift that thinking. And ultimately, um, therapy, uh, seeking a therapist um, can do that for you. And when you come into um, a place of where in your privacy of your heart and home and you make that decision to say that I need to seek help because I, I'm sick of tired of being sick and tired, um, that, that comes with great courage. It's something that's not, um, was it in terms of in our culture, um, you know, as a Haitian American to um, Haitian parents, as, as Dr. Joy to kind of piggyback on what she expressed is that a lot of that you have to sweep under the rug. And we know that although you sweep it under the rug, although it's under the rug, it's still in the house. These are things that will manifest in your life some way or another through substance abuse, through depression or what have you. So if we're not able to sit down with a, a culturally competent clinician who can unpack our, our emotions, our wounds, our traumas in a healthy way, and we're never able to really truly um, enjoy the benefits of what life has for us. Thank you, I appreciate that. Courtney, please jump in. If I could just tag it on to Benjamin's point and also something that uh, the Congresswoman mentioned around the cultural competencies of providers. And I would even carry that further to also just general access to treatments, because as Benjamin mentioned, you know, we often want to reach out to therapists who understand our experience, who are part of our communities, who understand some of the needs that we have and the traditions and other experiences that uh, Dr. Joy Harden Bradford mentioned, right, that are deep rooted in our traditions and our history. So it's super important for us to make sure that we can, you know, make ourselves uh, able to get access to new treatments, leading innovations, where unfortunately within the black community, we're often at a much lower end. The percentages are, are unfortunately 
staggering when you see uh, the lack of treatment, you know, versus within the black community as far as for mental health as it relates to the broader US population. And, and many of those things stem from basic lack of access, economics and other things like making sure that we have access to providers who understand our needs and can meet our needs as well. Very good. So speaking of access, uh, each of you, uh, last year, Congress approved the implementation of the National Suicide Prevention and Mental Health Crisis Hotline, 988. Uh, and they did that in the hopes of helping that our nation would recognize mental health emergencies in, in the same way that we dial 911 for most other emergencies. Uh, what I'm wondering from you all is from a policy or legislative standpoint, what initiatives or concerns would you like to see policy makers focus on to enhance the mental health and wellness of our community? Um, is it okay if I, I Benjamin, jump in? yeah, please. I don't want to step, okay. Um, I think obviously um, in, on paper, that's obviously a step towards trying to um, fix um, something that's broken. But I think ultimately the um, police who are the ones who interface and engage with our community on a whole are the ones that need to be receiving that training. Because in terms of when, when someone is perceived to be suicidal or having suicidal ideations or what have you, ultimately 911 is called. And when 911 is called, then the police are informed, then they come. And we've been at the, that's really been in terms of at the forefront of what's been transpiring where our men are not surviving that. They're not in surviving that encounter because there's no training. There's no comprehensive training for them to really interface and engage our community the way they should be. And rather than them coming on the scene and de-escalating the situation, many times they're the ones escalating the situation. So it needs to, I think, proper training to the personnel that's going to really be in contact with us. And from there, then we can start to build uh, in terms of having some type of um, broker, some type of um, relationship because there's no relationship with us, our community and the police. They're there to police their presence. It's not necessarily there to make us secure there in terms of if I want to go into talking and discussing about the projects where um, in, in New York City, you have um, police that are occupying 24 seven that they're there. That's, necessary, that's not necessarily something that's to the benefit of the tenants that live there. Actually, it makes them insecure. It makes them hypervigilant. It makes them anxious. And this is something that ultimately is harmful, which doesn't really broker any type of relationship between us and our police and, and the police force. Thank you for that, Courtney. I want to have you jump into this conversation as well. What are you? What's your take on this? Yeah, I mean, my take is first of all, I, I applaud the fact that we got nine eight eight. Now we need to also make sure that the implementation of making 998 available is done quickly because actually the rollout is supposed to take a number of years. So I think we need to accelerate that, right? Um, I think Benjamin makes a great point with respect to the training that needs to take place across the country for our professionals, whether it's law enforcement and others to make sure that they are knowledgeable about dealing with people who are in crisis uh, in need of mental health support because the one in four people who were killed by the police had an un untreated mental illness. I mean, that's the statistic. Uh, when you look at some of the other stats, 11% of African-Americans don't have insurance, right? So then when you think about going out to try to get support that maybe they don't have, they're gonna be able to look for support that let's say the general community can provide to them. So there is a significant need and all of these stats that I just provided are unacceptable, right? I mean, they, there is a true burning platform where we need to do more outreach and we need to see change happening faster, sooner in a broader way. Lastly, I would say, when you think about the mental health community, there are some great things that are in place uh, from a policy point of view to protect certain classes, people who suffer from certain diseases. If I think about those who maybe have serious mental illnesses and require mm -hmm. antipsychotics and things of that nature, 
So there is legislation to make sure that groups of people can get access to those treatments regardless of if they don't have insurance or other things. Well, there are legislations going on either at the state and federal level that are rolling those things back, right? We've seen that happen during, you know, I'll just call it the last several years, we've seen many of these policies begin to roll back to protect those who need the most help and the most support, especially when you think about in the mental health space. And so that would be one area I would implore that we need to do more and we need more help uh, from our leaders who are in position to set policy is to make sure that we're providing things that protect those who need the most protection. Thank you for that. Thank you. For the sake of time, and unless Joy, if you're burning to answer the question, then I want to have you jump in. If not, then I want to make sure that I get a, a couple of more questions in here. So please let me know. Would you like to comment on this one or should we? Yes, keep just very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I would honestly like to see the police completely removed from that process. You know, and some states are already experimenting with this. So I think we, we have to be careful not to feel like we have to recreate the wheel. You know, there are some states that are already experimenting with sending actual trained mental health professionals out on emergency calls when 988 is dialed or when 911 is called in the mental health crisis is indicated. And so I think we really need to move more to listening to what the community is saying they need in terms of responding to mental health crises, as opposed to thinking we can train police officers to do that work, because I don't think that that is actually moving in the best interest of our community. Yeah, or even not even just thinking about hiring therapists to come on to the force to be to sit in those places and spaces, because we can do both. Mm -hmm. I, I love that. I love that. Thank you so much. Okay, panelists, let me ask you this question. Now, one of our colleagues, his name is Resma Minikim. He is credited with saying, and I love this, he says that trauma decontextualized in an individual looks like personality. And that trauma decontextualized within a family looks like family traits, while trauma decontextualized within a people looks like culture. Black Americans have experienced social, psychological, and physical traumas unlike most other groups in America, much of which seems to purposely be unknown by current generations through strategic revisionism or just flat out omission from the history books if we're really just honest, right? Um, given this, what do you think that the greater society needs to better understand about the Black experience in order to better understand the state of Black mental health? Um, let's, let's jump in. Let's start with you, Courtney, since I haven't allowed you to take the floor first yet. So I think from the standpoint of the Black experience, I think there needs to be much more education, awareness, and admission, frankly, of many of the past transgressions that have happened uh, against the black community as a whole. Uh, I think the example that you used was, was fantastic because the trauma and some of the stereotypes that persist and pervade um, across our country uh, negatively impact the black community because of either past beliefs or either things that people are being taught um, you know, our children, you mentioned about in the school systems, things that have been omitted uh, purposefully. And so from that standpoint, when I just look at things that we're doing within our own company, right? We're doing training on anti-racism. We're doing training on allyship, you know? And I think uh, Ibram Kendi did a great job in his book, right? Where he talks about how to be an anti-racist anti -racist and, you know, you're either racist or you're anti-racist. Mm. And, you know, a lot of people, even in our discussions where we have dialogue, like I said, within our company, some people step back and say, whoa, I'm not a racist, right? I'm not. But then as you begin to provide much more education around things that you've learned or the microaggressions where you made a comment about somebody's hair or you, you did something. I was just in a meeting this morning and someone was giving me an overview about a, 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 a digital campaign that we were launching. And she was using the terms blacklist and whitelist. And these are terms that 
I'll call it within the advertising community that are freely used. And literally on the Zoom, I typed and said, actually, I don't like the fact that you're using the term whitelist and blacklist because the whitelist term is saying how good things are in this campaign. The blacklist term is saying how bad it is. And this is the same thing when you think about what happens across our society. It's these types of things that are permeated in history that we need to roll back. So I said, you know, when you tell me about the campaign being good, use some other term than blacklist or whitelist. Uh, and it's, it's those types of things that I think we need to think about how we systematically educate, improve capabilities and competencies and improve awareness and then hold people accountable to making, you know, knowledgeable, substantive change. Thank you for that. Dr. Joy, in a minute or two, can you tell us, to, um, give us a little bit of feedback here about what you think on this? Yeah, I think, you know, we have to divorce this idea that Black culture is synonymous with trauma and pain, right? There is so much more to us as Black people than our histories or the painful things that have happened to us. And I think we often run into trouble because people only see that part of our experience when there is so much more to us. And we know that we are not a monolithic culture, but I think it is really important to make sure that we are talking about and being able to kind of focus in on the entirety of our experience and not just the pain and the trauma. Hmm. Benjamin. I think um, ultimately as, as black folks, we understand what we've gone through. We understand our challenges that are ahead. And ultimately I think through education, in terms of when we talk about people who are not black, white, white folks that in terms of just in the curriculum um, coming up, there wasn't much discussion in terms of, of slavery. There wasn't mm -hmm. much um, talk about um, the injustices that have been um, going on. And I think ultimately, if we're constantly the ones to have to present that, and we're constantly the ones sitting down to have those uncomfortable conversations, um, I think that's probably more, um, that, that comes, that's part of the problem. We, we need to be able to sit down just because we, we are uncomfortable about this, um, about talking about racism has nothing to do with me. I mean, the fact is that we know in terms of what um, 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 Courtney has expressed is that the microaggressions, um, traveling, if you travel with your family, people are looking as if you don't belong um, in school, um, dealing with administration that possibly could be 70 to 80% white. Um, we know that Ultimately, there's a culture of um, bullying. There's a culture that has in, in, in empowered people to um, be racist. And we've just lived through um, that this past administration. And um, like Dr. Joy Hart and Bradford expresses that we are not just um, pain. I mean, we're, we're human beings. And I think we are able to sit down and have feelings just like everyone else. And in terms of we can validate one another, but it's ultimately, has in terms of pushing this dialogue forward is that for us to really have these discussions. They, they, mm -hmm. I don't think they're uncomfortable for anyone on this, on this panel, but at times people just shy away from not wanting to speak about what the truth is. And I think we, we have to speak truth to power. So talking about that then and staying in that vein, let's talk a little bit about dynamics as it relates to our field. Um, the American Psychological Association estimated in 2015 that roughly only 4% of mental health providers actually identify as black or African-American. And of those 4%, uh, black females outnumber black male therapists by a ratio of six to one six to one. So this means that realistically speaking, our white colleagues who make up 86% of mental health providers and other clinicians of color who collectively uh, make up the remaining 10% of mental health providers across the country, they'll undoubtedly have to play a vital role in the ongoing care and restoration of black mental health. I wanna know from the panel, what do you think is needed to ensure that non-Black clinicians and other mental health professionals have the cultural competency necessary to positively effectuate the mental health needs of the Black community? 
Yeah, those numbers are staggering when you mm-hmm. when you hear that, right? And I saw um, somebody dropped a question about, um, you know, getting more Black people involved in the mental health profession. And I think that there are so many layers there. Um, so kind of to start with, I think that white therapists and other non-Black therapists are going to have to make sure they're doing their own work, right? And what I mean by doing their own work is unpacking all of the biases and unconscious or conscious that they have as it relates to working with Black people to ensure that they are not further traumatizing Black Mm. people when they come to your office for help. And so that looks like talking with one another. We are not responsible for doing that unpacking for white white therapists and other non-Black therapists. That means talking amongst themselves, doing group supervision, doing the readings, doing their own therapy so that they can continue to provide safe spaces for people people when they are hurting. Um, The other thing, Spirit, and I'm sure you've been paying attention to this, is that most therapists I know have wait lists months long, right? So while there was already a broken system, even before the pandemic, now in the midst of the pandemic, you cannot, it is very difficult to get an appointment with a therapist, even if you want to. And so I think we are going to have to be very creative in looking at ways that we can all do things differently so that we can provide support for people who so desperately need it, especially in the Black community. We know how we have disproportionately been impacted by this pandemic in terms of the lives lost and just the grief and the stress. And so I think we're going to have to be very creative beyond the one-to-one therapy model so that we can continue to provide the support that people so desperately need. Mm -hmm. Courtney, what would you say here? So two things. Uh, First and foremost, I would say we need to increase the number of Black providers in this space, right? Because the statistics that you shared, certainly there's a huge disparity there. And so we need to increase that because I think when there are more professional colleagues who can kind of talk across their ex-societies, different meetings, then I believe there is a mutual education, right, that takes place when, you know, folks are talking together. The second piece that I would uh, suggest is, you know, if you think about it, kind of 86% of the providers being white, we need them, right? If we're going to get treatment, a large portion of it is going to be treated by somebody who is, you know, a white counterpart. And so I would say part of our role, we need to also be more bold, and I'll call it proactive, in helping to explain and share some of the concerns and needs that we may have to help further sensitize those professionals who are providing us treatment, right? I think we need to bring up You know, if I think through back, you know, before I became more involved in the healthcare space, you know, I always would say, oh, you know, my doctor, they know everything. I'm just going to sit here and do whatever they say do. Now I'm much more educated. Number one, there's much more information available to me. So I'm an educated patient. I'm an educated consumer where I'm going in and saying, hey, I've done my research. Here are some things that I want. And I think I would suggest that we as a community need to better advocate for ourselves and our counterparts more, but also to provide that additional education and making sure that people understand the sensitivities and understanding and knowledge that they need to have to better serve our community. Excellent, excellent. Benjamin, what would you say about this? Well, I mean, um, for, uh, you know, for a long-term, we just need to have more uh, people in our community going into z- this profession. Um, mm. Obviously, the numbers uh, um, sh- um, present that, but um, you know, ultimately, we have to see in terms of coming together with the resources that we do have, um, so we could provide that to um, our, our community on a larger scale. Um, basically, you know, in terms of these forums, where, um, as um, Dr. Joy expressed, she was saying that the one-to-one this, in terms of in this crisis, having um, a backlog of cl- um, um, clients trying to reach out, waiting lists, we, we don't have um, the, we, don't, we can't supply the demand. So ultimately, if we're able to do something on a larger scale to where they can come in on, on Zooms, it's, it's just a bigger platform to be able to speak to 
a group. And, 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 and number, I think this is kind of being redundant, but if we were to have um, like support groups, support groups are things that allow multiple people with shared experiences to be able to talk and have a discussion about what they're going through. And that provides uh, an, another outlet as opposed to the one-on-one. -on -one. Okay, so then if we're talking about this and we recognize that there is a scaling that needs to happen and that there is an address that needs to happen and some of these things can happen immediately and some of these things will happen over time, you know, keeping that in mind, I wanna ask you all in more recent years, the catastrophic consequences of systemic racism have come to be more widely recognized for the public health crisis that this system has created. And I want to know from you all, given the challenges that currently exist in our nation's efforts to effectively address systemic racism, especially as we've seen in the wake of COVID-19, um, as well as the unforeseeable challenges that will undoubtedly lie ahead for us, what actionable steps do you all think that we should be focused on right now in effort to meet the long-term mental health needs of our community? Can we start with Courtney? So I, I think there are probably four or five areas that maybe I would just highlight very quickly that I think we need to address because as you mentioned about some of the systemic racism, discrimination and other things that have created inequity in our society. When I look at the criminal justice system in general, uh, you know, many people with mental health illnesses are being treated in our jails and prisons. Right, and we need to do some things to address that. You know, we've already talked about, you know, uh, issues that need to be improved with regards to helping to manage when people are in crisis. We call 911, and the training needs to have, you know, be provided. But also, too, when I think about healthcare, you know, as, as a whole, we need to make sure that healthcare disparities are addressed to help with this issue, housing is another fundamental. When we think of many of the fundamental needs that we have, we've got to do a better job with me making sure that good affordable housing is accessible where also our children can get good high quality education. And then lastly, I would say on the financial front, we need to make sure too that, you know, we drive greater economic empowerment within the black community because many of these issues are deep rooted in money, right? They're deep rooted in financials and people's ability to be able to afford and gain access to just basic uh, high quality needs. So when I think about some of the underlying issues that we've seen, you know, get highlighted, uh, let's say over the last year and a half or so, where while everyone's been working from home or you know, during the pandemic and everybody's been watching TV, we're seeing this over and over. They're not new phenomena, So there are things that we need to fundamentally address and hopefully, you know, our whole system, our society has been awakened to drive the change that we need to see happen. Hmm. Okay, thank you for that. Benjamin? Um, I think we just, um, in terms of when, it comes to our community not to criminalize uh, mental illness um, because these same um, things that um, white people are, are, are living with or suffering from, it's a totally different um, scenario that's played out. Um, we're incarcerated, rather they're um, brought to a facility for, for treatment. I think um, that has to stop um, in terms of just on, on the basis that if you are seeking and in, in need or in need of um, mental uh, wellness, that you should be able to you should be able to get that, and that's something that should be able to um, be um, ascertained once you're um, taken in. And and I know um, we spoke about police involvement, but it, they're really at the root of the engagement in our community. And until there's some type of um, you know, some type of uh, li liaison between our community and them, where we're gonna continue to be um, criminalized for something that shouldn't be criminalized. You, I mean, everyone ultimately has something that they're working through in their life. And the fact is that if we're um, criminalized for that, ultimately, what, what are we left to do? 
And we need to, it can't be this duality, this double standard of what happens in white areas and suburban areas is something that shifts when, it, when they are in our community. We were, we're over-policed and the fact is that we're not, um, we don't have the option of a treatment center where we're, we're incarcerated. So I think that's something that would, would need to change. Absolutely. Dr. Joy. I think I would add to that um, more effective or any peer support program. So we already talked about like the shortage in terms of therapists, but there's lots of research that talks about um, peer support programs like texting lines or support groups like Benjamin mentioned. Um, so people getting trained in those modalities. So mental health first aid is a great training course that lots of people can take um, to be able to recognize like when other people are in distress and how you can kind of make a first level intervention. So this is not calling everybody to be therapists, but there are things that all of us can do to be able to recognize symptoms of distress in other people and then know where to um, send them in terms of resources. So I think more effective and any present um, peer support programs would be a really good step in the first, in the right direction and something that could happen pretty urgently. Okay, I wanna get to some of the questions. People have tons of questions. And so I'm gonna ask this last question because I think that it's very important um, as we talk about supporting clinicians and we talk about cultural competency and the need for more um, black clinicians to be front facing in our work. And I wanna know from you all, especially since Courtney brought up the, um, the issue of economic equality and bridging that divide. Given the economic hardships that are typically associated with being a minority owned business owner, um, how can black mental health providers be better supported in our efforts to meet the mental health challenges of our community? Because if we can't be there and we can't keep the lights on, then we can't service our community. So how do you think we can be better supported? Well, uh, I'll jump in first. One, I think we need to support our community, right? Because mm -hmm. some of the discussions we had earlier where we said there need to be more of us, right? To, to make sure that we understand the experiences and there need to be more professionals. We as a community need to support those providers within our community. We need to make sure uh, that we're doing that. So I would say that's an important piece. The second thing is that there need to be programs that further support the needs. And especially when you think about the difficulties that the pandemic has brought in and, you know, brought on many small businesses and their ability to just stay afloat, right? So there does need to be support from the federal government. So as I think about, you know, as we're talking here as part of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation and many of the things that our leaders are doing as they're thinking about budgets and policies, we need to make sure that there's budgeting put in place to support these critically needed capabilities in the communities in which we live. Uh, so I would say that. And then lastly, I would just say that, um, you know, partnering with some of the different agencies that are in place. There are a number of great advocacy groups that are out there where we can partner better together uh, so that we're not as fragmented and making sure that we're helping each other. I think there needs to be much more outreach and partnership support, you know, from those different providers that are out there so that we are mutually helping each other as well. That's great. Benjamin or Dr. Joy? You know, Surit, I really think this is important because I think sometimes what happens is that because the system is broken, it will often pit black therapists against black clients, right? So black clients are struggling and desperately want services and then they can't find black therapists who accept insurance or their caseloads are full, right? And so it seems as if black therapists don't just don't want to help when the truth is that a lot of insurance panels are not paying enough for therapists to be able to keep their lights on, or they are not actually accepting new clients or accepting new therapists on their um, insurance panels. And so I think that's the other thing we need to look at is how the system will often pit us against one another and make it seem as if black therapists need to assume the responsibility for curing as much as hard as many of us are working. We can't do it at the expense of, you know, taking care of ourselves and our families. Right. And so I think we 
we need to also have really serious conversations about healthcare, which of course, right, it goes back to all the things that Courtney has mentioned, um, you know, that it really is a systemic issue and we, and we should not expect black therapists to be the ones assuming the brunt of the, of the issue um, because the system is broken. Benjamin, would you like to close out my series of conversations before we go to the audience? Um, no, that, I'll pass. I'm, I'm, okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm, they're, they're well, I thank there. you guys for indulging me. And I hope that those questions were curated in such a way that the audience found value in those. And also, I mean, I know that the answers that you guys gave were just invaluable. So I thank you for that. Um, let's go to the audience while we have a few minutes. Um, one question, you all that uh, the audience would like to know. Often we have difficulty helping our relatives understand that they need to seek help for mental illness. Uh, when there is a crisis, it is often too late. The question is, how can we get ahead of this problem and help our relatives understand that they need help? Would any of um, you like to jump in there? I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I think, um, it's, it's one of the things in terms of, uh, in terms of with family, especially with family could be a little bit challenging. Um, and only because a family member could be a little resistant, a little reluctant to, um, to listen in terms of what you're advising them. Um, culturally, we know that in our family, that's something that's not really promoted is, uh, in terms of seeking therapy. So if um, as advice, um, as an intervention would be the family to come together to and, and kindness um, and love to be able to express to that person that you do need to seek support. You do need to um, sit down with someone to be able to kind of move to work through what's going on in your life. As family members, obviously we are, um, are we were basically the, the relationship we have, we can tell that you are not what, who you are. We're not in terms of you being a shell of yourself and we, we can identify that. So, but Ultimately, um, in love, trying to set up some type of family intervention where you can maybe reach out to have a, um, a clinician come in to, um, to, to moderate that and, 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 and you can possibly go from there. Thank you so much. 60 seconds or less, would either, Joy, you're, you're in, the, in the trenches as a clinician. How does somebody do this and let their family know in a loving way that they need help? So I think it is important to focus on the behaviors as opposed to you trying to make a judgment about what you're seeing. So going to someone, as Benjamin mentioned, in love saying, hey, I noticed that you are um, not jumping on the family Zoom calls as often, or you know, it seems like you haven't talked to friends or family in a while. I'm wondering if there's anything that I can do to support you, right? As opposed to saying, you're depressed or anxious, you need to talk to somebody, right? Like that's a very different tone. And so going to them, noticing the behaviors that you've seen, I think can really help. Also, if you have your own experience of seeing a therapist, that is beautiful to share with other people because then it, it normalizes it, right? So when we can talk about the ways that we've struggled and been helped, other people in our lives can see that as well. Um, the other thing I would encourage is for you to do some of that legwork for your family member, right? So when people are really depressed or struggling, it can be really hard to take those steps of finding a therapist or even looking at resources. So if you can do some of that groundwork for them and give that to them, then that may encourage them to kind of, you know, follow in the path that you've already laid out for them. Super awesome, super awesome. Courtney, Benjamin, Dr. Joy, Thank you, thank you, thank you for an amazing conversation today. I wish that I could have you guys for like another hour because there's so much that I want to get into, so many conversations that yet uh, to be had. But we will table that for another time. That way we can all come back and do this again. And what I want to remind each and everyone who has attended today, I want to remind you first and foremost that we all have mental health and wellness that we are either dealing with or it's dealing with us. So if you do not have a great therapist, if it's been a while since you have seen a therapist, make sure that you focus on your mental health and wellness first 
make sure that you don't forget the mental health and wellness of our children. Remembering that 50% of all mental illness begins before an individual is 14 years of age, the onset of those symptoms. And 75% of all mental illness develops before an individual is 24 years of age. And the onset of symptoms and the time that we actually see someone in our office, the average time is 11 years. 11 years, it's far too long. Please stick around. At the end of this closing, there will be a brief survey for you all to take. Thank you so much for joining us on this Equity Summit panel. It has been an absolute pleasure. Mind your mental health and continue to bang on the system.